Hello and welcome to the video. In this video I'll be sharing my Viking ale recipe and brew day. After having lived in Norway for some years I actually went out of my way to learn more about old Nordic traditional beers. Some of these styles are actually still brewed in Nordic regions even today. Unfortunately they're not actually very popular anymore though. When inquiring about these styles I found that in actual fact most people found that they really did not enjoy certain aspects of these beers and really favour beer styles that originate from other parts of Europe. Many said that it was a shame that those old traditional Nordic beers had some strange tastes added because they felt that they would enjoy a really balanced version. So for me a challenge was set. I decided that as traditions are really something that are very important it would be fantastic to brew a beer that combined all of the best parts of these styles and leave out the parts that people really disliked. I had a lot of fun formulating this recipe. After some trial runs and tweaking I had a beer that most people seem to really enjoy and this is the beer that I present for you here today. It has a nice range of flavour notes from the malt and the juniper with a nice smoky background. Most people tell me that it is complex and flavourful and interestingly different from beers they have tasted before. So let's have a quick look at the recipe now then. You will find this recipe in a couple of places. First and foremost you'll find the full recipe in the YouTube description and secondly you'll find it on the grainfather.com website under the recipe tools. I would suggest instead of actually searching for this recipe by name it's actually far quicker to search for my name which is David Heath and then you'll see my recipes that are on there in the database. As always if there's anything you're not sure about then please do not hesitate to contact me this is no problem at all. Alright so let's get on to the brew then. So first things first, let's have a quick look at the grain crush that I have here. Please note that the kernels on my grains are not smashed to smithereens, but at the same time we have plenty of the good old white stuff. This is the sort of crush that you want, and I'd recommend a gap of credit card sized. If you're not actually milling your own grain and you're having a homebrew store do it for you, then be very very specific with the sort of crush that you want and do this every time. That way you will have the same type of grain crush or every time and thus you will have repeatability if you keep going with the good practices that I'm showing here. What I would recommend you do is find some sort of tool that you can use to add grain at about a kilo at a time and make sure you give it a thorough stir as you go. Also note that I'm adding the grain as evenly into the mash tun as I can and this is something that will help you. You really don't want any grain clumps within your mash. Naturally a good part of actually avoiding grain clumps is actually making sure that you give everything a really thorough stir. And towards the end of your mash when you have much more grain within the mash tun you're going to need to start breaking it up from the top and giving it a really good working around. This way you'll avoid any further problems. You'll also notice that as the, the mash actually gets thicker you're going to need to start stirring it from not only the top but the middle and bottom also. So I'm now towards the end of this actual doughing in process as it's known and you'll notice that I'm doing a lot more breaking up of the grain here now and really just finalizing the whole thing and I realize that this may appear that it takes a fair amount of time and actually it does and it's very important that you give this part of the process due attention because like your grain crush if you don't get this part right then it's going to impact the rest of your brew no matter what you do. 
OK, so now that's all finally done, it's now time to start the mash, and the grain father has selected the first mash step in this recipe. While that's going on, I organise everything else that's needed for the brew, and that starts off with organising my sparge water. There aren't actually many additions during the boil for this one, but I set them out in a good order anyway, because that's just how I like it. Going left to right we have our hop addition, which is just one in this case. We also have our yeast nutrient and Irish moss. And then at five minutes we have those all important juniper berries. And then on the far right you can see I've got my yeast. Personally, because this is a Viking ale recipe, I'm going to be using Quake yeast for it. And I've actually got a Fram Garden strain here that I've recultured that's just come out of the fridge and I'm letting it get up to room temperature ready for putting into my wort later on. Hops wise, I'd certainly recommend that you can substitute what I've used here, but certainly only use noble hops. We don't want anything extremely strong like American hops because they will override this brew and that's not really what this is about this is about complex flavors of malt and juniper yeast wise for those of you that don't have access to fake yeast which Frankly, it's a shame if you don't. It's very easy to obtain on the Quake for Facebook forum. But what you can do is you can use strains like Liberty Bell or one of the drier strains like uh, M44, West Coast Ale. In order to contribute to some of the complexity in this beer, I've actually opted for three mash steps. And this is very, very good practice. And you'll notice that we've gone about 10 minutes over what we would normally do for mash in. And that's also something that I've done on purpose because I really want to make sure that the gravities that I'm looking for are definitely reached within this because of some of the more unusual types of malt that are involved in this. I think you'll agree that what we have here is a very beautiful looking wort and I was extremely encouraged by how nice it was looking towards the end also. And you can see this a little bit better in this final picture, which was taken during mash out. Another thing that I like to do while the mash is in place is start sanitizing my fermenter. I use star sand for this, and it's essential to make sure that this star sand's pH doesn't go above 3. So now the grain father has taken us through our various mash steps, it's now time to raise that gr grain basket and start our sparge. The sparge is also an area where we can actually gain some efficiency and actually some flavour too. The process here is that you're simply washing sugars from your grain. And there are various different methods in which to do this. And I would fully suggest everybody just stick with hand sparging. It's far more effective. And hey, you've got an automated brewing system. You can do something, surely. In this series of clips of me sparging, I'm showing various different ways in which to cover the plate. And this is something that I get asked quite often, so I'm going to cover it here in a bit more detail. There are a few methods that I use during any particular sparge. And the first one is, is that I actually like to draw rings on the mash plate. And I start off always going from the actual perimeter of the mash plate, uh, the edges, and then I start to move in towards the actual middle. The next sparge that I do will be the complete inverse of this. So it will actually start in the very middle and I'll back gradually make my way towards the edges. Another method that is also very good for making sure you have correct coverage is to actually cut the plate in half in your mind and just sparge on one side and then the next time you add your next litre, sparge the other half. Never allow the water to actually run fully dry and never allow it to go past those two hand clips that you have on the top of the plate and all should be fine. But the less water that builds up, the better. 
Once the sparge is actually done, it's important to leave the mash tun in place until you reach, well, almost boiling point really. I tend to lift it back up at about 95. This way all of those uh, sugars and the remaining of your sparge water will come through. When I'm ready to actually remove the mash tun from the grain father, what I do, as you can see in these photographs, is I put a plastic bag over the top. And the reason for this is that I want to flip this into a bucket and have all of the grain in a bag. It just makes life so much easier and hey, anything that's easy is good for me. So we're now actually almost at the boil. And one thing that I really enjoy about these small batches is it's a very, very quick little brew to do. Because you haven't got quite the same volume of liquid, the actual boil time is far reduced in terms of the waiting. So we saw that there was some of the hot break there, so I've now started stirring in the head. This head, as I call it, is just simply protein. And you'll notice on certain brews, like for example those that contain wheat, you'll get an awful lot more of this. So what I like to do is actually stir all of this in first before I actually start the, brew, the boil timer. And then I put in my first hop addition. Quick time warp ahead now and we've got a fairly clean top and I'm now adding my hop addition. This is actually the first and last of these in this particular brew. It's important to spend a little bit of time actually just uh, skimming the top of the head here just to make sure that those hops are assigned into the actual brew itself. As the 60 minute boil of this brew actually progresses, you'll notice that little bits of protein will start accumulating again. Give those a stir in as you did at the very start. And also one thing that you really must do, and you know, this isn't a high protein grist, but still do it, is give that bottom plate a nice scrape. This will stop any deposits accumulating and triggering off the protection of this system. And we really don't want that. Of course, then we would need to flick the switch at the bottom and basically uh, continue. What I then do is I actually pause the boil timer and I set up the counterflow chiller and I use my boiling hot wort to sterilize it. I then wait for the system to get back up to the boil, which in my case, because my sea level is 99 degrees C, and I then restart the timer. Our actual late addition in this brew, and it's one of the most important parts of the flavor of this particular style, is to use juniper berries. And it's important to realize that these are never something that you want to crush and then add to your brew. This will literally impart way too much flavor and take over the entire taste of the beer. And we certainly don't want that. Before adding our juniper berries though, we mustn't forget to add our Irish moss, which I'm adding in here now, and also our yeast nutrient. As you probably notice, I'm not using a spoon. To be quite honest, I didn't have one to hand, and I'm quite happy to add them as I showed you there. After adding both of these, which were within a minute of each other, I then gave the whole thing a nice little stir up. And then at five minutes to the end, in go our whole juniper berries. And I've got to tell you, one thing I really like about brewing these types of beers is the smells that come off of that. Oh yeah, it's so nice. Now what I would suggest at this stage is to actually give these a bit of an extended stir. You don't want to be stirring so heavily that you're losing temperature, but enough that you're making sure all of these berries are getting in with this wort. Then as soon as the timer hit zero, it was time for a five minute whirlpool, followed by a five minute stand before I started the chilling phase. Here's a quick look at how I do that. You can see that I have a hook which is actually on the ceiling where I have a rubber strap that comes down and I put the wart out hose onto this and then into the conical fermenter. This means I get lots of nice oxygen hitting my wart which really keeps the yeast nice and happy. Once my wort was all transferred into the conical fermenter, I then pitched my liquid yeast. 
I was really happy to see that I actually got exactly the gravity I was aiming for, despite having a bit more um, wart in my fermenter, so that's always nice to see. I was also very, very happy with the colour and clarity that I had in this wart already, so that's always a good thing to see at this stage also. So here was the scene soon after the brew and um, this yeast I'm actually going to ferment at 30 degrees C so the conical fermenter has got a little bit of work to do ahead of it just to raise it up by 2 degrees but that won't be a problem at all. Within 2 hours of pitching this yeast a very vigorous fermentation started. Early the next morning it had dropped 22 points of gravity. You gotta love quake yeast, not only is it a fast worker when it comes to the fermentation, it tastes conditioned as soon as you start to bottle it. I couldn't really be happier with these strains and use them for most of my brews these days. I do hope that you all enjoyed this video. I certainly had a lot of fun making the video and of course doing the brew. So if you did like this video then please do go ahead and like it on YouTube. This really helps me out and allows the videos to be seen by a wider audience on YouTube. I've got a lot of videos in the pipeline for the future so if you're interested in uh, seeing what I've got coming up then please subscribe for future content. If you have any questions on anything that I've covered in this video or in others or anything to do with brewing in general then please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'm more than happy to help. Until then, happy brewing.